Comic-Con here back at Comic-Con. And we have already aired two episodes, and we have two episodes to go of Greatest Geek Year Ever, 1982. What do y'all think? All right, by, by, by show round of applause, how many of you have actually seen the first two episodes? I go on the CW now. Yes! Yes, it's here! Yes! Or on the CW app, where you can now watch it over and over and over again. <laughs> Because guess what, ladies and gentlemen, we've been up here many, many times over the years for panels orchestrated by, by Mark Altman. And we have officially solidified that 1982 is the greatest heat year ever. So, with that, I'm sure there are a few of you who have not yet seen our awesome trailer or have not yet seen the show at all. So here's just a taste of what you will see when you go on the CW app and watch the first episode of Greatest Geek Year Ever, 1982. are some very dazzling science fiction films. There are a lot of great years for movies, but 1982 is the greatest. That's the year that I officially fell in love with movies. I can't during my life that the lineup was equivalent. Week after week, you have one classic movie after another that holds up 40 years later. It was this great moment where nerds accidentally won. There are two Steven Spielberg movies coming out within a week of each other. We're here. I remember calling my agents and saying, I don't know how much this is gonna do for me, but I think it's gonna do a lot for the world. It shows you can think about it. It was one of the most transporting movies I'd ever seen. You would certainly argue there were better years for cinema, but there's no greater geek year than 1982. Greatest geek year ever, 1982. Docu series premiere Saturday, July 8th. Stream free next day on the CW. Alright, let's hear it! We did it! We made it! It's out there! We got on the fucking network! partners that I've, we've, we, the three of us have worked our tails off on this. And we did it during a time while, quite frankly, you can talk to any filmmaker or, or a TV producer, any showrunner, trying to make anything during the year 2020 or 2021 was truly a mission impossible. But mission accomplished, I want to introduce to you my producing partner, the writer of Greatest Speaker Ever, 1982, Mark A. Altman. <laughs> You know, I like being off to the side. I felt like Artie and Larry Sanders. I may just watch from the back. No, no, you are on this panel, and you deserve to be on this panel. I also want to introduce a friend who I've gotten to, I met really for the first time in 2016. Too close for comfort. Uh, I met him in 2016 when he was making a documentary for you know, the Rob Curry Wall, the, the deleted scenes of Star Trek, the original series, which is amazing. If you don't have it, it's awesome, but I digress. And now we work together on 1982 Greatest Geek Year Ever. He is, he, he shot the interviews, he directed the documentary series, and he edited the friggin' thing. More than 100 interviews and clips oh. and behind the scenes and, and old commercials and what have you. Roger Way Jr. Come on up, Roger! We had a hug him? I didn't know we had to do the hug on the camera. Oh. All right, so first of all, I just want to start with you, Roger. You know, when, when we finished doing our interviews in November of 2021, I did not see Roger again. Uh, I, I was like, what happened to our documentary? Did it, it, did it disappear? Did you run away with it? But he finished it. Roger, how proud are you that it's done, and not only did it get finished, but it turned from to be a documentary feature to a four-part docu-series that aired on a network. I, I feel great. It's amazing that we're getting this kind of an audience now on CW and with the app, uh, because we really worked our asses off. This is, you were saying, it's 100 hours, over 100 hours of interviews. You know, we had uh, EPK footage, behind the scenes footage from all these movies, footage that was filmed by the actual filmmakers like you know, the director of Beastmaster had all these reels. Henry Winkler had reels, countless reels of uh, home movies. Super 8 movies. movies. Yeah. Oh. That he gave How do you get Super 8 developed in 2020? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know now. 
We have to go through all of that and figure out a way to not just tell, not just tell the stories of the making of each movie, because we didn't just want it to feel like a DVD or Blu-ray special feature, and like a, as we had been stringing them together for each film. We wanted to tell a story of a specific era in the industry, in fandom, you know, in movie going, and how different that is from today. You know, we wanted that thread to carry through the exploration of each film. So last uh, October, I went with Mark to Spain for the Citrus Film Festival, which is like the greatest fantastic fest in the world where our documentary, se our documentary feature premiered. And so, you know, I've been covering, you know, I'm, as an entertainment journalist, I've been covering the business for like 30 years. And, you know, I'm always the one who's like going on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and everything, you know, posting about the movies I saw and what I thought of and everything like that. So we're at dinner afterwards, and then I'm going on Twitter to see what people are saying about our feature, which was really cool because it was all good stuff, thank God. But Mark, tell us about how the transition happened to go from a documentary feature to a four-part Well, you series. haven't really experienced this documentary unless you've seen it in the original Catalan. <laughs> um, it was... Uh, it was interesting because, of course, in Spain, the film was dubbed in Spanish and Catalan. And during the time that a lot of these films came out in 82 was the Franco era. So we're like wondering how many of these films have people in Spain actually seen? And it was really funny to watch because the films that got, we knew Conan would get a big response because it was shot in Spain. But like Diner got a huge response. Megaforce, huge response. Go <laughs> figure. I mean, it was so weird to watch that documentary. And I have to say, before we go any further, there are a couple of shout outs we need to give the people in this room who could have done this documentary about. Um, Scott Tipton, great comic book writer and historian is here. It's good to see you. Um, Boris Austin, who is an associate producer, it's good to see him here with us. Um, John, John Perry, who is instrumental in taking this from a feature and turning it into a four-part TV series. So great to have John here. And I to thank Clay. Everything is going extremely well so far this year. <laughs> and last but not least, and I have to say most importantly, so I hope nobody is insulted, our co-producer, the great Isaac Altman, the, the great uh, no relation, yeah, there's a little relation. But the co-producer, researcher, his first IMDb credit, and it was truly earned. He worked like a dog for very little pay. These producers really take advantage of the talent. Isaac Altman. Yeah. Isaac, Isaac, please stand up. This is Isaac Altman. He's still working. So when he, was, when he was working with us on doing the interviews back in 2021, he was half that size. <laughs> So now I'm watching the documentary and I'm going like, like, who that, who's that guy on the, on the screen talking? He looks like Isaac Alton, but a little bit old. No. All right, so. My and no Nepo, baby. He worked really hard. Well, we all did. We all worked very hard. We did more than 100 interviews between uh, May of 2021 and November of 2021. So basically, it was between Delta and Omicron. When Omicron started to, uh, you know, sort of happen, we are like, okay, that's it. Let's just, let's just keep going and just, you know, that's when Roger disappeared into, uh, into Viger and, and just, uh, that's 79. But you get, you get well, you'll point. see a few people are like on TV sets because they wouldn't come into the studio because of COVID. So we did them remotely and that's why they're on these little TV sets. And the next episode, I think it's Raphael and DeLorendis and uh, Buzz Fetishand who would produce Conan. Like they were lovely and they would have been happy to talk to us, but we ended up having to do it remotely because of COVID. And there were a couple of people who we lost because they just wouldn't come into the studio because of COVID, which was unfortunate, but nobody that great. Okay, you know, well, <laughs> great. But so the first two episodes, so episode one was called The Summer of Spielberg, because as you all know, June of 1982, it's one thing for Steven Spielberg to have two movies a year, and he's done that many, many times. In 1993, really good year. July, he had Jurassic Park. In December, he had Schindler's So that was a good year. And then in 97, I think he did The Lost World and uh, Saving Part of Life. Amistad. Amistad. Not as good a year. Yeah, that was also a good year. Um, and 2022, he did Minority Report and Catch Me If You Can, but I digress. So, but the difference is, is that in June of 1982, June, he had two movies open one week apart in on June 4th, 1982, the same day that Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan opened, Poltergeist opens. 
Why the week later, E.T. the extraterrestrial opens? Now, E.T. he directed Poltergeist, maybe he directed? <laughs> um, and we talk about that in the documentary, but I'm just curious, like, Roger, when you were going through and you were, you were working on what became part one of the series, you know, we know a whole lot about sci-fi and fantasy and horror and all that stuff, but what was something about that first episode, the first couple episodes that, that we worked on? That first you, couple, there are only four. Well, there's, there's four, and we aired two. So what was something that, like, you didn't even know that surprised you? That's interesting, I can't, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, there was, I don't know there's a specific thing I didn't know that surprised me. I think it's just the volume of people that were able to speak about sort of the uniqueness of the films that were being greenlit back then. You know, you had, there's a great story in that first episode from Dean Devlin, who went on to produce Independence Day, um, The Patriot, a lot of huge, big films. You know, he talks about how now, you know, he can't, that, the kind of films that were being greenlit back then, you know, would never get the green light. He, today. he, said, he said Independence Day would never have been made no. today. Unless you not. called it War of the World. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he went into a pitch meeting, they said that. And then Teddy Biaselli, who's one of the major executives at Network, conveyed the same thoughts, Lisa Henson, you know. So that was kind of shocking to me, because I'm so used to those films, because I grew up with them, right? So I was like, this, this vibrancy in terms of creativity lasted for many years, but now it's not there anymore, and so many people who are now in the industry feel that and realize that, and that, that was kind of shocking to me, and I, and I agree, it was, they're right, you know. But that first hour was the most difficult to, to assemble. Simply because you couldn't just jump into the summer of Spielberg, right? You couldn't just jump in into how, you know, those two Spielberg movies came out back to back and then Wrath of Khan was in theaters at the same time. You really needed to explain everything that led to that moment of reaching critical mass, right? And how about how the filmmaking of the 70s sort of um, created something in an organic fashion that now the studios wanted to replicate. And by 82, all of them were firing. Uh, major motion, you know, major event movies into the theaters and realizing that the audience that loves these movies, these genre movies, is a significant part of what makes a movie successful at the box office. So we had to explain all that. So we had to back backtrack and begin at the 70s, really, with the a tour of filmmaking of the 70s and those, how those sensibilities came into play with filmmakers like Steven Spielberg and George Lucas and John Milius and uh, they were utilizing some of that but bringing it into a, into a form that was appealing to a huge audience. Mark, what about you? What was something about maybe the first two parts, either Summer Spielberg or Sci-Fi? Of well, I'll tell you, but before I do that, we had one more person walk in who uh, was part of the documentary, was a bio part of the documentary, and uh, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge him. Ron Martin Burnett, where are you? There you are. Oh, Rob Burnett's here. Yeah. Rob Burnett, you got more spectacular than I have to say, when in trouble, I would go back to the Rob Burnett interview. Because Rob was my guy to give me the turns and help me take the story to the next, you know, horizon, you know. And, and when Rob and I have worked together many times doing documentaries, so he's great at giving you those, um, you know, those wayfindings. Well, this show was made for Rob because if anyone can talk, it's Rob Burnett. So when you have a four-part series, who do you call? Not uh, Burnett. Not those you call Robert Burnett. And Mandy. I mean, as great as what he had to say in the documentary, there's so much on the cutting room floor that is great as well. I mean, this could have just been Rob Burnett talking about the film in 1982 for four hours. But anyway, Rob, good to see you. Thanks for coming. Oh, thanks for the documentary. And the wise pearls that you dropped throughout. Yeah, I think he's in every episode, right? Yeah. So, so things so, in the first two that I didn't know. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you, I, I've said this before. One of the things that's fascinating, we had, you know, we tried to marry having very high profile people like Bill Shatner and Henry Winkler and Ron Howard with people maybe that were a little under the radar. So one of the people that I asked, because he'd been on Inglorious Trexperts and I knew he had great stories, was Eddie Egan, who was the unit publicist for Star Trek II. And in the course of interviewing him, and this didn't go in the documentary, it was cut, it was in the longer version, but it got cut, was he told us that the uh, Sonic and David Marcus were cast by Gary Nardino, who was the head of um, Paramount Television, is the plan had been that if Star Trek II had bombed, they would spin off Sonic and um, David as a, um, a TV series. And, and that was the plan, had the show not worked. And so Nick wasn't even involved with really casting them. It all was done through Paramount Television with the eye to doing a TV series based on um, those two characters. And that like blew my mind, because I know a little something about Star Trek, and so when I heard this, I was kind of shocked to 
to hear it. I never heard that story before. And he was just a font of great information. Um, but you know, Star Trek II, obviously the Blade Runner stuff in the second episode is really interesting. And of course, you can't be, you know, Charlie Pilazarik is amazing, Dangerous Days documentary. What, you know, it's hours and hours and hours. Three hours. So we really wanted to focus on distilling the story of Blade Runner into you know, good 10, 15 minutes, but also talk about the stuff because they're always gonna say the final cut is the best. And I love that there's a little debate going on as to whether or not the narration is a good thing or a bad thing and why it exists. And I think that was a really interesting part of our Blade Runner. But obviously Megaforce is the true zenith of everything in this series. And I gotta say, I got a text from Barry, not text, I got an email from Barry Boswick uh, like two days ago who watched it. And he said, I love it. This was great. That's exactly what I did in my joyful, self-deprecating way. <laughs> All right, so, so, listen, the Barry Boswick stuff was gold. And so, so are so many of these interviews, and I'll, I'll get to, you know, Ron Howard and, and Amy Heckley, the director of Fast Times in a moment, but for me, like, the thing that really kind of, like, made me sort of see a perspective, so Adrian Barbeau, who had a great year for 1982, she had Creep Show, Swap Thing, and she was the voice of the computer in John Carpenter's The Thing, and she was also Mrs. John Carpenter for quite a while. So we were talking about the month of June and how The Thing was a bomb, even though now it's regarded as like one of the like greatest horror movies ever, and it is still incredibly disturbing, but still really, really awesome. So uh, I had asked her, like, why did E.T. become this huge monster hit, no pun intended, and why did The Thing bomb? And she thought about it for a second, and then she said, I'll tell you when John knew that we were in trouble. She said, they were at an airport, and E.T. had already opened, and the thing was about to open, and E.T. was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. And he looked at me, this is her, she says, he looked at me and he said, we're in trouble. Because that was the alien people wanted to see, clearly, because it was such a huge hit. Not the alien <laughs> as a pandemic that we saw in the thing. Well, if again, the creature the thing ate Reese's Pieces, it would have been fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, so you know, definitely the summer Spielberg part one, and then you have this, this, this great part two with, with Wrath of Khan, with, with the thing, and Blade Runner, and Tron, and Megaforce, something like that. Thank you. Great, this is awesome <laughs> stuff. But, so, part of the reason that we are here is not only to like celebrate that, 1982 is the greatest year ever, thank you. Uh, but also to show you, for everyone in this, in this room, you'll be the first to see exclusive clips from our next two episodes. But only the people have been watching the first two. Has everybody been watching, I hope? Who's watching them? I mean, I'm going to the CW app, like, tonight. <laughs> and, and I just like have your parties or whatever, and you know, there are no actors around, you got nothing else to do, right? No <laughs> documentary on the CW app, it's free, even if you have direct TV and you can't get it, just go and, and stream it, you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be great. Watch it again and again. It gets better the more you watch it. <laughs> so that is actually true. So I watched it when it aired, and then I watched it on the app, and I was like, you know, you did a great job editing this thing. It's really, really well, fun. There's so much information into every one of We have 40 some minutes on the CW, right, for episodes, so there's the amount. 47 minutes. 47 minutes. The, the amount of stuff. information, the amount of films we cover in each episode is just unbelievable. And we pick up the thread of sort of the industry and fandom and all these other things that are carrying throughout the four shows, so. Are you ready? Are you ready to see an exclusive <laughs> clip from this Saturday's <laughs> episode of Greatest Speaker Ever 1982? All right. So, Sylvester Stallone had not one, but two amazing movies in 1982. One of them was obviously First Blood. Here's the other one. Yeah. I'd love having control of this. Well, you're a control freak, what can I say? <laughs> John wanted to write the piece himself. That was the only way he would be interested. And we had a little contentious meeting, I'll call it, with Dino about 
That's not the right one. That's Conan. <laughs> well, you're, you're, fired, fired, Hans, you're fired. Don't blame Clay. It's all your fault this year. <laughs> well, you should be showing it. They didn't want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing like that. Gotta love live Killing the buzz by like, stopping the video. I went with a friend of mine who's also black to see Rocky III on opening weekend. It's a sellout audience and people are amped. When Mr. T came on screen, my friend and I fell in love with his character. We were loudly cheering for Clover Lang. <laughs> get him! Get him! Knock him out! Knock him out! You know? And then he does knock him out. <laughs> theater goes quiet. Me and my buddy's voices are the last ones echoing, yeah! <laughs> and it's just, you could hear a pin drop. Silence. And I leaned over to my buddy and I said, Rocky better win. At the end of this movie, or we're going to have to go out the back exit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for this clip, but yeah, that's uh, Darren Scott, uh, producer of Menace to Society. He's done a lot of other great stuff. He's a terrific guy. He directed Deep Blue Sea too. But what I love that you don't see in that clip is David Goodman, our uh, chief negotiator for the WGA, who's awesome, talks about um, the fact that Rocky Three, unlike Rocky One and Two, which are very much '70s movies, Rocky Three is an '80s movie. He says it's a superhero movie because basically. You have Rocky, who's your superhero, has to team up with his old nemesis, Apollo Creed, to basically fight Thanos. <laughs> and, and, and it's completely different from Rocky 1 and Rocky 2, which are really grounded, dramatic movies. And then suddenly Rocky 3, it's like it's a, it's a superhero movie. And he's not wrong, because by the time Rocky 4 comes around a couple years later, you know, Sly is bringing down the Berlin Wall and saving America from godless communism. <laughs> All right, so, so for the, the upcoming episode this, uh, this Saturday on the CW, 8 p.m. Eastern and Central. So we're covering action films and we're covering fantasy. So what are some of the revelations that we can see from this third episode? Oh, you know, that, actually Dark Crystal has some really interesting uh, moments from... Uh, yeah, the Dark Crystal! Woo! The Dark Crystal! Jim uh, Henson's daughter uh, is in that segment and she talks about how important that movie was uh, for Jim, that he actually, you know, he had sold the Muppets, I think, everything, he had sold everything, and uh, he used a lot of that money to bankroll the film. That's how much he believed it. Um, no, to buy the film back, because it wasn't yeah, testing it was well. Yeah, it wasn't testing well. The and he believed in it so much, he sold the Muppets. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he but bought he the Muppets the back money. and Dark Christmas. And he bought it back. That's he called the kids and said, you know all that money we have from Sesame Street, the Muppet yeah. Show and everything? Well, I'm using it all. You're he a he, he put a, he had a family meeting and he told everybody, this is what I'm doing with the money, just so you guys know, in case we get evicted a month from now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. I don't know that anyone other than Jim would have had the nerve to do that in, in, in terms of believing in, in the story. And obviously history has proven that he was right. Because then he sold it all to Disney for a gazillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what, what about what about some of the action films that we've seen? Well, I mean, I look, I think uh, I really like the third episode because as you'll see in the Conan clip coming up, um, we got the outtakes from Orson Welles' um, commercials trailer for um, Conan because at the time, you got to remember, fantasy was not a respectable genre, right? It was, uh, you know, people would look down upon it. It was like B movie with Roger Corman. So when they did Conan, it was a big risk. So he said, how do we make it prestigious? We hired somebody like Orson Welles, Citizen Kane, to do the thing. And we got these, he did not want to be there. You know, he, he was doing it for the money. And uh, so we have the, 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 the outtakes from that recording session, which are fantastic, and how he refuses to say, rated R, uh, and nobody admitted uh, under 17 without a parent. It's great, I love that. And then, you know, some great stuff on Tron. Um, obviously, First Blood is fascinating because, of course, the original ending of First Blood, uh, Rocky, Rocky, uh, Rainbow, Rainbow died, right? Spoiler alert. And then they realized, you know, Sly wanted to change it so that he doesn't die. You wouldn't have the whole, all the Rambo movies had he died. Um, and the other thing that was really interesting that I didn't know is Chris Mulkey told us 
um, that originally Kirk Douglas had been cast as Troutman, but he started uh, butting heads with um, Stallone because Stallone kept making his role smaller and Stallone's role bigger. So he's like, I'm not doing this. He leaves and they have to hire Richard Crenna, who's so amazing, like on no notice. And so he comes up like the first day of filming to do Troutman. So there's a lot of really interesting things, I think, in that third episode um, that's coming up. Um, you know, so, so here's the thing. So in 1982, in the summer of 1982 especially, I was 13 years old. And to be a 13-year-old geek in the summer of 82, to have all of these movies come out one after another, I mean, I just thought that this is the way the movies were supposed to be. I just thought that was Star Trek Bar Mitzvah. That is a nice lie. Absolutely, I had a Star Trek Bar Mitzvah, and I'm damn proud of that. Oh, I should show pictures. Well, yeah, please don't. Yeah, on the, the movie version. So, but to be 13 and to be like, gee, it's. June 4th, do I go see Ratha Khan or Poltergeist? Well, duh, of course I'm going to see Ratha Khan. Ask your rabbi. And I told him, and I told him a great story about how when I saw Ratha Khan and I spot died and I got home and I was all set and I was crying in my room and I laid out all my Star Trek merchandise, all my photo novels, my trading cards, my poster books, and my, I was crying, my dad knocked on the door and he says, what's the matter? And I was like, <laughs> stop dog! And my dad, who is, I love him, love him dearly, but he's not the hippest guy in the world. But he looked at me, he rolled his eyes, and he said, don't worry, he'll be back. <laughs> we we that that but, you know, I got, to, I got to 1983, and I was like, well, uh, you know, every year is not like 1982. But I'm curious, are there any, like, around 13-year-olds in the audience here? Okay, good, okay, yeah, good, okay, all right. So, for 13-year-olds today, you have Barbenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> but we had Rathacon, and Poltergeist, and E.T., and Playboy, and Thing, and Tron. Tron was awesome. Tron was awesome. But let us now see the, the, the clip I was going to show before uh, for, for Conan. So you had Stallone and Schwarzenegger both releasing movies in the same year. And now look at them, uh, now they're old. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's roll this next one. John wanted to write the piece himself. That was the only way he would be interested. And we had a little contentious meeting, I'll call it, with Dino about the casting of the movie. He was not initially convinced that Arnold was the correct person to have play Conan. Dino was concerned that Arnold had an accent. Conan, what is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear a lamentation of the women. And John immediately said, well, but Dino, you have an accent got Dino sufficiently angry. John came up with a solution. He said, Dino, I have a great idea. If you don't want to use Arnold to play Conan, I have the perfect person to do it. This will solve all your problems because he's a great movie star, Johnson, Dustin Hoffman. At that, he said, okay, get out of here. Go make your movie. I think it might be one of the best uses of Schwarzenegger on, ever on film. Before that, Pumping Iron was great. Nobody had really figured out what to do with that guy yet. Millie has figured it out. And you sort of see the emergence of a genuine movie star. We got an X three times on Conan. One of the things that we did to finally get an R from an X was we had to discolor the red from the color of the blood because that was their big complaint. Conan was not marketed as a dumb fantasy muscle man movie. It was marketed as a blood-soaked epic. Dino did not like the movie very much. Felt it was too violent. He went with great trepidation to the street view in Las Vegas. We filled the movie theater and, and there were more people out there. And they were all hardcore fans. It was a multiplex, so we had three theaters going. There were still reels of film, so we took one reel from projector of the screening room one to screening room two to screening room three. The audience went wild. Having said that, Dino continued complaining for years. Had it been a lower rating, it would have made a lot more money. 
We love the movie. We love making it and we love watching it. I think Dino was very proud of the movie. The problem at the time was sword sorcery and fantasy was considered a B-level genre. So how do you elevate it? How do you put the imprimatur of class? Well, you get the most prestigious filmmaker of all time, Orson Welles, to do your narration for the radio spots. When Welles came out to the recording studio, he was out of breath, in a bad mood, he was very cantankerous. I'll take my own time, I don't need any directions. Just bring me a glass of water and that's the end of it. Get done with this thing. I won't do it. I won't do it. You have to get an answer for that. I don't do that kind of thing. And I told the engineer, the moment Wells steps into the studio, keep the tape rolling. So in fact, what he didn't want to say, I recorded. It isn't because I think I'm too good to say this kind of stuff. But technically, if you go from this kind of uh, casting of the spell, within a 30 second thing, you suddenly say under 17, not a minute without a parent. It's almost a joke, it's a bad laugh. Whereas if a different voice says it, it's, it's simply an obligatory statement. You know what I mean? He was in terrible shape at that time, except for his voice. It was still the Orson Welles voice. And he said, Murph, now I'm out of breath. And the truth is, I don't want to do this thing now until I'm rested. Thief, warrior, conqueror, king, Conan the barbarian, out of an age I dreamed of, comes the most incredible adventure of all. Conan the barbarian from Universal Pictures. Rated R out of 17, not invented without that. <laughs> Sitting there, 
Uh, and, and Henry films him in the middle of all this empty set. It's a restaurant, but it's a set basically. And he's just sitting there like this, looking at his notes, trying to figure out the day. And that footage is just kind of priceless. And the fact that it's Henry and, and Ron on camera talking to us, telling you the story of their friendship and how important that movie was for them personally and professionally. Uh, fantastic. Well, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the movie, the premise is, a lot of you may not be, it's uh, about these two people who set up a brothel in the New York County morgue. But of course, they're not uh, pimps, they're love brokers. Love <laughs> brokers! <laughs> um, it, it, you know, again, it, it's great to shine, one of the things we love was shining a light on these movies that maybe didn't get great bonus features ever on a DVD or Blu-ray, or that people maybe aren't as much a part of the conversation as some of the more high profile movies. I, I think we did that a lot, you know? That's why people, I think, were so excited about Megaforce. But also, you know, Night, Night Shift is another example of that. Yes, we have 48 Hours, and yes, we have Tootsie, and yes, we have, uh, um, obviously, Fast Times in a big way, and even Zapped, which Rob has some great comments. Zapped! Yeah. Yeah. Zapped! But, uh, but, but, you know, Night Shift gets a lot of love, and a lot of that is because Henry and Ron's love for this movie comes across really well, and obviously having those home movies were just gold. So, so the, the thing is that this was Ron Howard's first studio film. He already directed Two Lane Blacktop, uh, that was an indie. But so, so first of all, we go to Ron Howard's. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Two Lane Blacktop. No, Ron Howard. You took a Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto. 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 Yeah. Yes. Three words. Cars. Throw me a ball in there. You're stressing me out. All right. So, so we go to Henry Winkler's home. And he was seriously, I mean, every rumor you heard about, oh, it's like the nicest guy in Hollywood. Oh, tell the story. That is actually fine. true. What he did. But, but so what happened was he loved the interview so much that he helped us get Ron Howard. That's not said, the story. He <laughs> said Ron Howard is a, he, he loves the film, he's proud of the film. Uh, you know, Night Shift helped launch Imagine Films with uh, Brian Grazer. And then he says, oh, I got these great home movies uh, that I shot during uh, the making of Night Shift, did you want them? And I'm like, we all look at each other and go, sure. <laughs> so, here is a clip, and I'm gonna show the right one this time. Here is the clip. And you were going, not only are you the first to see this clip from episode four of Grace Geek Year Over 1982, you are the first person in the entire universe outside of Henry Winkler's own family to see Henry Winkler's Henry's own Spain. personal home movies <laughs> behind the scenes making Night Shift. Here we go. Not only does 1982 have all of these wonderful genre films, but it has peak comedy. Prostitution! What are you kidding, Alex? We can say it. Yeah, you can say it. We're big kids now. If there's one person in Hollywood who lives up to his reputation as one of the nicest men in Hollywood, it's Ron Howard. He got his big break with Roger Corman directing. In 1982, you really see what a fine director he's going to become with Night Shift. It has a premise that probably would never get greenlit today. These two guys who work in a morgue end up becoming pimps. A real comedic tour de force. Pimps? Are you saying we should become pimps? Pimps is an ugly word. We call ourselves love brokers. So I was doing the Fonz on Happy Days. I had done the first seven years with Ron Howard, and Ron said, I'm thinking of being a director. What do you think? I said, Ron, if you wanted to be a brain surgeon, whether I needed it or not, I would be your first patient. <laughs> well, my contract for Happy Days was, was up, and while I loved the people on the show, it was holding me back a bit. Now, I was making films. I'd made four films while I was on Happy Days, they were television movies or the, the Roger Corman movie, which was made on a very fast schedule. And the Auto, directed by and starring Ron Howard. I could just see that one of the reasons why I was struggling to get feature films was that they didn't believe I really had time. They really thought of the feature directing as a sort of hobby. I felt I needed to take a leap and make a commitment. We're doing Happy Days now. I don't have a Ron Howard. My brother, my acting partner. There was a breakthrough from the studio. They said CBS will pay $5 million in pre-sale for Night Shift if Henry Winkler stars in it with you directly. This combination is something that they're willing to invest in. It was very important to me to make an R-rated movie. 
initially. I didn't want people to think uh, this was the guy from Mayberry and Arnold's Diner. So Brian Grazer's idea, which was sort of inspired on an article that he read in the New York Times that a couple of guys had been caught running a prostitution ring out of the New York City more. His concept so fit the bill in terms of the kind of irreverent, sexy, high concept that I was looking for. Now he told me, he confided in me, I'm 25, I'm doing a studio film. This crew has done every film under the sun. They have years and years of experience. Are they going to listen? Hold it back up, back up, and action. Ron is and was so confident in what he wanted his movie to be that he would stop for a minute to think, and I'm telling you, you saw the entire cast and crew go, that is not even hyperbole. I just totally trusted him. Working on Night Shift is where I discovered that I actually loved shooting in the streets of New York and also just about any big city. As difficult as it can be to get the shooting permits, as frustrating as it can be, you have to deal with uh, traffic issues. There's just something about those places and storytelling that just fuel one another. Feeling all right this morning? Great. Yeah, me too. Yeah. We didn't get snow and we didn't really get our skyline, but here we are. Making yeah, movies. The scene where we're running down the street at the end is my neighborhood. My mother was there standing on the street corner watching us film. It was like just incredible. The movie had tested incredibly well. David Geffen wanted to buy our points in this movie. He was so sure when he saw it that it was going to be a massive, massive moneymaker. And then you have this wonderful film that I think got the award for the worst publicity campaign of 1982. Chuck Lowley's a nice guy. The only time he gets to rest in peace is at the office. City Monk. It never really got the steam in the movie theater because people got confused about what it was. That was a disappointment. It was a really big year for movies, but exciting for Brian and I, but also the sort of our generation to begin to plant a flag and say, we're gonna make the 80s be sort of about our introduction to, to you audiences. One of the great compliments of my life is that Ron, on the last scene, 59, the last take, one, he said, that's a wrap, Henry, here's the clapper. I've had it since, I love it with all my heart, I love him, I love the movie, and it's a wrap. Get out of here! <laughs> I don't know about you people. This is a morgue. You're partying in a morgue. <laughs> okay, how, how cool is that? How cool is that? So, uh, so when we were when we finally were able to get Ron Howard, so he was in London mixing uh, Thirteen Lives, which is a really good movie. It's on Amazon Prime. Excellent film. So he's like, he's in London, I'm in LA, it's, during, it's still during COVID, so I Zoomed with him, we hired a local producer who put up a camera to shoot the interview, and then I'm sitting there doing the interview with him on Zoom, and then I'm watching the documentary going like, wow, it's like that was like there. <laughs> but I was in a Zoom, like, you know, Zoom is awesome, thank God it's been a lifesaver. So, okay, so, uh, okay, so this is episode four, so, like, for everyone who's, who's here right now, make sure you go on social media, say you've been to this awesome panel, and, and spread the word, spread the word about the greatest geek year ever, 1982. The, the social media is how you spread the word. So go on Facebook, go on Instagram. If you want to use Twitter. Threads. Threads. <laughs> That's fine. Threads. We'll allow it under the circumstances. We have 1982 any, any, movie, that 1982 movie. Any, any other party more to show our final clip here, uh, because uh, 
it, you know, all these movies, especially people think like E.T., oh my God, it's like the biggest movie in 1982, and it, I think it was the biggest movie ever until, you know, that movie about the ship in the iceberg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. what's it called? I forget. But, what, okay, uh, do we have any prizes, anything to give? Anything? We have no prizes, but did people get posters? And if not, there's still gonna be some more. Whoever came in late, and shame on you. Doing that. All right, I just got to ask. When you first person raises your hand. You should be leaving because the next panel is free enterprise and glorious for experts. So I expect you to stay. All right, so for the for this real fast step, uh, the first person to raise their hand. I didn't ask the question. <laughs> what won the Oscar for best picture? Okay, you. Done. Good. You watched, you watched, you watched the show, did something, didn't you? But you'd be surprised how many people do not know that Gandhi, a four hour film directed by Sir Richard Attenborough, which I saw once, won Best Picture over ET the Extraterrestrial, which I saw 50 times. But uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at this final clip. Go Yes, five minutes. Five, perfect time. All right. So let's see how many people can guess who won the best picture. Of five. You just have this really remarkable year. There is a diverse group of films ranging from comedies. Do I look like a dame? Not as much as I do. I would turn on a chart. To dramas. And no one's told me that he wouldn't go back to China until he had achieved something in America. Even in terms of traditional romances, like An Officer Turned Gentleman, which was one of the most successful movies of the year. Got a girl in the mail in the world? No, I ain't looking for one either. What are you looking for? And in a year in which you had Blade Runner, The Verdict, Diner, My Favorite Year, Fast Times at Richmond High, all these amazing <laughs> films. What wins Best Picture? 1982, Best Picture, I don't know. Ordinary People for Best Picture? Yeah. 82. It's gonna be something forgettable. Oh, no, I have no idea. Not Tootsie. Five Squad. Simon Rage. My favorite year. Fitzcarraldo. Annie. You're looking dangerously. I would assume that Sophie's Choice would be the Oscar winner that year, but I'm probably wrong. Gandhi won that year. Okay. <laughs> I don't know so. I distinctly remember that because I didn't know what it was. <laughs> Gandhi. Wow. Really? My name is Gandhi. Mohandas K. Gandhi. What? Gandhi. Oh. We don't want you here. I suggest you get back on that train before it leaves. Gandhi. Wow. I don't remember what happened. I know he wore a robe. And he was sick. I was the hardest. I've actually never even seen Gandhi. I don't know. <laughs> Did Gandhi ever say deeds not words? <laughs> yes, he probably did. But not as bad as I did. <laughs> Gandhi was a lovely movie. It was epic. That was not a better film than E.T. Should Gandhi have won Best Picture over E.T.? It certainly does not have the impact that a movie like E.T. had. It was obvious to anyone in America in 1982 that E.T. was a phenomenon. So I couldn't wrap my brain around E.T. not winning for Best Picture. At the time, Entertainment Tonight allowed me to do kind of an editorial saying that much as I respected Richard Attenborough's film Gandhi, in the years to come, people would look back and say, how could they have given it to Gandhi when E.T. the Extraterrestrial came out the same year? They was robbed by a backward-thinking academy. Because for decades, the Best Picture Award always went to a movie that was important, with a capital I. While they gave lots of awards to E.T. the Extraterrestrial, so they clearly appreciated the movie and even loved the movie, it was not an important movie. I feel like the Academy Awards is the story that Hollywood wants to tell the world about itself every year. Look at who we are. Look at what's important to us. Isn't Hollywood amazing? Aren't our values fantastic? 
That's what the Oscars are. That's what they're trying to do and promote. And that year was such an unbelievable flashpoint of so many filmmakers hitting their stride and just this amazing explosion of stuff that still, 40 years later, resonates enormously loudly in pop culture. So, you know, Best Picture, to me, became irrelevant that year. All right, so with the, with the one minute we have left, I just want to say again, actually spread the word. Make sure to watch it on the CW app because you can watch it anytime you want, as many times as you want. Again, please do spread the word on social media to watch A1982. Grace, keep your over 1982 because... Saturdays at 8 o'clock. If you watch it, if, you, if enough people watch it, we will do another A sequel. greatest peak <laughs> year ever. Wait a minute. So now, what is that? He said 99. I know. I know. Okay, so, uh, uh, what year should we do next? 88. 88. Uh, 99, I heard. Uh, what else? 94. 94 is a good one. What else do I hear? Uh, uh, 94, 94, do I hear 90, 97? Do I hear 94? Do I hear 87? 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64, 64